Hey, Funkin' fans, please don't forget, you can always go to patreon.com forward slash nice guys. Please make a donation for the show. We want to keep the lights on. I have nothing to add. You, you did it so well, Strickland. Let's just get no, on with the show. No, but you need to add something, Doug. Come on. Uh, contribute, please. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash nice guys. That's the spot. Please, we are 100% funded by you all. And uh, so far, we're 100% funded by you all. <laughs> Let's just keep going. As little as $2 a month. That's all we need. Thank you. If you think their grammar's bad, wait till you see them in person. Here's what's coming up on the Nice Guys Today. How do I find information that I need in this huge space of everything online? And some of that's going to be information I don't even know that I need yet. And ideally, these algorithms would bring me to that, right? They're going to find out all this stuff about me and say, look, you may not know that you need this yet, but we can tell that this is going to be a problem for you or an opportunity for you. And we're going to drive you to this so you can kind of anticipate that and act. The nice guys on business podcast, the sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wasteoids, dweebs, dickheads. They think they're righteous dudes. Need an education on how to grow your business? The nice guys are here to help. Learn about great customer service, networking, and how just being nice can help you prosper. Now, here are your hosts, Doug Sandler and Strickland Bonner. Hey, nice guy community. Welcome back. Welcome back today. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I want to jump in, but my name is Strickland Bonner. Your name is Doug Sandler. I don't want to skip all that stuff because this interview today with Jen Goldbeck, Oh, man. Dr. Jen Goldbeck. You know me, Doug. I I am such a geek for the numbers and the reporting and the analytics. You're going to love this. And man, she is all about that. And God, I I find it really sexy. Oh, wait a minute. You can't say that. She's so smart, though. Like, it's smart sexy. Uh, You know, there you go, womanizing again. We would get in trouble. If we went to a conference and we started the conference, well, I have a speaker that came on to the show today, but she's really cute also. You know, the first thing that they're going to say is, what does the fact that she's cute have anything to do with anything? But I would say, I would argue that the fact that she's not only extremely smart, she's passionate about her message, and she knows how to dress so well. I mean, all three of those things are good. Now, if it was a guy, I would probably say the same thing. He, I think I did say the same thing. We had Adam Brewer on on our show. Oh yeah, you real about smart guy, cybersecurity, really great hair, <laughs> really <laughs> great. And I told him, I said, Adam, you got really cool hair. I think I told him on the show. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna side with you on this one, Strick. No, but you're right. You make an excellent point. Like you shouldn't open with that. Yeah, and and true. by the way, Jen did a TED talk, so she knows. I mean, you you can't do the 15 minute TED talk without prepping and knowing and knowing your audience and knowing how to convey a message and i guess for listeners that have been around for a long time you guys kind of know us but you we may have some strictly. new listeners and i'm sure jen has never listened to an episode before she has a brain in her head this will be the <laughs> first one not. she's listened to so probably i don't want to open with for somebody that has no impression of us whatsoever I, hey our speaker today is really cute you're right it's it really is unprofessional and right, jen, so let, i apologize so let's so let's just pretend the episode started right now so can you oh, start okay. it again? okay just go ahead Hey, my name is Strickland Bonner. On the other side of the microphone, Mr. Doug Sandler. Welcome back. Welcome back, Funkin' fans. Doctor, that's right, Dr. Jen Goldbeck on the show today. She is a geek, and she is smart, and she is all about analytics. Now I'm going to offend her by saying she's a geek. <laughs> you, what, what am I going to do? I, I don't know how to, I don't want to be offensive, you know? I, it, are we too PC now? I don't well, know. Well, I met Jen at an MPI conference in Washington, D.C. a few months ago, and she wowed me with her knowledge about data. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Who do you think owns, every time you do a, a search on Google, who do you think owns that information? I'm guessing Google has it somewhere. They, it's probably like I put my name in and I put my search in. So I'm guessing Google probably okay, owns great. it. So would you ever want Google to come back to you, let's say in 10 years and say, Strickland, these are all the things over the last 10 years you did a, a search on. And some of them are maybe appropriate. Some of them are, it's no, none of anybody's business what you did a search on. Maybe you were into rom-coms and you wanted to find out information about a certain <laughs> rom-com and, and, you're in a con, in a, and you're a member of, a, of a, an association association that is the the association against rom-coms <laughs> and you don't and you don't want people to know that you're a closet rom-com viewer 
So that's the kind of stuff that's like, well, who owns this information and who is going to use this against you? She even gets into the, the, a story about somebody that, um, uh, a, a young girl that was in her mid-teens and was getting uh, information through the mail, congratulations on your pregnancy, because the purchases and the things that she has made through a certain retail establishment would lead them to believe that if other people made those purchases, they probably were pregnant also, but she hadn't told her parents yet. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, it's a tough balance because Interesting. You know, I know it's unusual. I actually listened to this interview already before we've done this, which oh, unusual. is really unusual for me, <laughs> right, for me exactly. to listen to it at all. Right. But, you know, Jen talks about something that we've talked about on the show before. You know, if I'm going to be online and I'm going to see ads and you know what? The Internet is ad based all right it is it just like television just like radio right and i'm okay looking at ads i would much rather see ads that are targeted towards me than things that i don't give a shit about at all right and so i am totally fine with that but it is how are they going to use it do they have altruistic means and you know that is a great gray area right there because you're right somebody could sell this to somebody and 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 use it against me but in this particular case the people that are selling it to they're selling it to advertisers who know that they're this girl is searching for you know pregnancy or diapers or how to take care of a baby or whatever it may be and they're trying to be helpful but it's not always no, going to so be are helpful. you going to are you going to use your data for the power on the side of light or the side of darkness so we have a really in-depth conversation about that totally totally interesting topic a topic that i originally thought when i heard that jen was going to be a guest on my on my mpi show that i was doing before i even invited her onto the podcast i was thinking uh, this doesn't sound like it's up my alley. I'm telling you, it is right up your alley because it affects every one of us every day. And she's got a great message and she presents it really well. So uh, let's get to the uh, to the interview with Dr. Jen Goldbeck. Did uh, you get to the promise statement? Oh, no. Let me do that. The promise statement right here is for us to provide a learning experience that is entertaining and adds value to your life. If you feel like we could do better, if we could do differently, if we could do anything, please let us know. At DJ Doug is my Twitter handle. At Nice Guy on Biz is Strix. Just let us know what you think about the show. We are proud to be affiliated with the C-Suite Radio Network. We are now entering month, I think, three since the network is, has uh, gone into existence. And we have well over 30 shows that are a part of the network. This is crazy. I'm enjoying, crazy. I'm enjoying this ride so very much. So uh, should we get to the interview? Funkin' fans, whatever we can do for you, or more to the point to you, please... <laughs> Let us know. That's right. Just send us the data, whatever we need to do. Dr. Jen Goldbeck, right here. Let's take a listen. So today on The Nice Guys, imagine having a, a modern day crystal ball peering into the future, telling you what your personal and your professional months and years ahead will look like. Well, we're stepping up our level today on The Nice Guys. Dr. Jen Goldbeck, uh, she is a real-life data scientist, is director of social intelligence, uh, the director of the Social Intelligence Lab at the University of Maryland. She's a TED speaker and a, a soothsayer. All right, well, maybe I added that, <laughs> that, that last part. Welcome, welcome, Jen, to The Nice Guys on Business. Glad to be here. You know, we, we had an opportunity, just so everybody is aware of, um, of how we met, because how a scientist would ever come in contact with the show, we have no idea. But th just so everybody <laughs> has a kind of a little bit of a background, we met at a conference for the Meeting Professionals International, and I was so fascinated by just your bio. Uh, and then I watched your TED Talk, and then I saw that nearly 2 million others also watched your TED Talk, too. So can you share, Jen, what, what a data scientist does, and, and why do you think that data science is, is so popular right now? Yeah, you know, I mean, at the core, it's not necessarily all that new. Like, we collect data Data scientists actually spend a lot of their time just cleaning up the mess of data that you get wherever it comes from, doing some statistical analysis of it, and then doing some machine learning on it, which is really the place where, even though machine learning has been around for a couple decades, we're suddenly starting to make this breakthrough with the huge amount of data we have to get really new insights from machine learning that we weren't able to get before. So help me for a second, because I, and I know maybe I should know the term machine learning, but it's it's new to me, and I'm assuming that that's something to do with artificial intelligence, or is that a, a whole different world? No, same thing. Uh, artificial intelligence, I suppose, is a broader term, but machine learning is really it's definitely artificial intelligence, and the idea is that you have some algorithm, and there's a bunch of machine learning algorithms. But essentially, they train the computer to learn patterns. So you give it a bunch of data about, say, a specific day's weather, and then you tell it, all right, so for that data, 
this is a day we would go to the beach. And then you give it another day's worth of data and say, you know what, this day we wouldn't go to the beach. And eventually it learns patterns of maybe what the temperature or the precipitation or the cloudiness or whatever has to be. So you could give it data for a day that it's never seen before, and it can make a good guess about whether you would go or not. So it learns patterns in the data to make predictions for data it hasn't seen before. So when did when did you discover as a uh, as a doctor or maybe as a kid when did you discover that that data could be kind of cool? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Was I an adult or a kid when I learned that? It was probably in college. I went to the University of Chicago as an undergrad. I was an economics major. I actually finished with an economics degree. With the Freakonomics guys, I took classes with them when I was there. And, uh, you know, as an economist, it was not quite quantitative enough, though economists do plenty of quantitative work. But that class that I took with the Freakonomics guys really got me thinking about data beyond, you know, markets and the kind of thing economists normally talk about and into human behavior and what could data tell us about that. Um, and that is what kind of pushed me towards computer science, which is what I also I got another undergrad degree in that and then ended up going through my Ph.D. there to really see what could we do with data? How could we become smart about it? How could we make predictions from it? Yeah. And let's talk about some of the some of the practical application. I, I, first of all, let me go back to when I was in college. I mean, they were doing COBOL and Fortran and, and some other programs. And we were actually using punch cards and going to the computer. It was. Oh, no. <laughs> it, it was it was not a fun experience because all we were doing was drawing. Uh, I guess it was the mod, the uh, the uh, the previous to the modern day cat drawings. You know, we, if, it, if it came out right, you had a picture of like Superman on your uh, on your. I don't even know what that what the, we were using freaking printouts. I don't even <laughs> with with the uh, oh jeez that was so long ago. I don't even want to talk about it. It was in the eighties when uh, when the PC the IBM PC AT and XT were like all the rage. <laughs> It's a you're a little before my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, all, all good. So uh, the practical application of what you're talking about, and and as I'm watching, and I know a bunch of other people have already commented about the um, some of the examples that you use on your TED talk. It's so fascinating that companies are using this all of the all of the data that's out there. But talk about the practical application. So we use the weather example, but but how does it affect things like marketing and and fashion trends? and all of that kind of stuff now, too. I mean, on the base level, you see these algorithms every day in the recommendations that you get, anytime that content is personalized for you. So that would include things like rec uh, recommendations from Netflix for shows, Amazon suggesting products to you, but also Facebook uses these kinds of algorithms to figure out what to show in your timeline. And all of that's personalized based on a record of what you have done and interacted with, and essentially it's trying to predict what you're going to like to see in the future, whether it's something to watch or buy or to interact with online. So there's a lot of that that's happening. But as these algorithms become more powerful and we get access to more data, you're starting to see new applications in marketing, for example, where you can really create a personalized, targeted advertisement that speaks to me specifically in the things that I care about. Uh, but we're also starting to see it used in things like medicine, being able to predict diseases that people are likely to develop and then do early interventions in that space. There's just a ton of places where now that the data is all digital, right? We're collecting it data, uh, native digital format. We can pull a ton of it from online sources or big data records. It's opening up this huge space of domains where we can apply this, and some of it is going to be tremendously helpful to humanity, and some of it is really creepy and could be yeah. exploited in a way that people don't like. Yeah, I, that, and that's the part that, that kind of frightens me, and I'm sure frightens many in not just my community, but in the world as well, because you know you can use your power for the, for the, for the light side or for the dark side, and that really begs the question, I mean, who owns all of this information? Are we giving permission to companies like uh, Google to use the search data that we're using to, to sell to marketers? Um, and what if the info gets into the wrong hand? Because it's not just about passwords. I mean, these are like our innermost thoughts, things like the vacations that we're going on, product and services and the alarms that we're buying. You know, if we get a little bit uh, spooked and we and we buy an alarm, is that triggering something? Shopping for guns, you know, all adult content too. I mean, is, whose business is it anyway? I mean, and who owns all that? I know I just said, throw a whole bunch of shit at you just at one time, <laughs> but who who owns all of that? All of that information? Yeah, the most important part of that answer is that not us. Not uh, us. Okay. We don't own it. 
And uh, so on the day that we're talking, the Senate is actually voting on a resolution to make it even less us. Uh, There's rules right now, for example, that give you a little bit of protection, like your Internet service provider. So that might be Comcast or Verizon, the people who send the Internet to your house. Right now, they don't have permission to use all of your Internet history. That's every search you do, every site you visit. They can't just give that away. But today, the day that we're talking, the Senate is voting on allowing them to do that. Take everything you do on the Internet and just go ahead and sell that to anyone who wants to. So the protections that we have over that extremely sensitive data, right? I mean, just think about, like, yeah. if I showed up at your house and asked to, like, look at your browser history. Like, I hope you would say no, right? Right. Uh, it's mortifyingly private. Uh, yeah, those rules look like they might be repealed today. So we're actually getting less and less protection of our privacy in terms of this data. And not only is that concerning because the data itself is private, right? Every illness I search for, uh, every weird you know, intellectual curiosity I have. I don't want people seeing that. But the algorithms make it so much more powerful because those little things that I may want protected just for the content end up being tremendously revealing in terms of all kinds of other things that I may not even dare to search for. And so that data now is basically in the hands of corporations and they can do whatever they like with it and we have no rights to tell them no. So share share with my community what it is when you say, and maybe this is simple as just, it's just a formula, but what is an algorithm? I mean, is it just like if you do this and this and this, you are likely to do this? And, and then how can that be manipulated? Yeah, so the core an algorithm is kind of like a recipe. Take this data and do this thing to it, and then when you're done, do this thing to it. There's tons of different ones that we use, but essentially that's it. it is, it's a step of processes. The machine learning algorithms that we do basically take that data that's input. So it could be everything that you bought on a particular day at a store or every post that you liked or shared or spent time reading on Facebook. And each one of those data points goes in with some what we call ground truth, like true data about you. So it could be you bought all of these things and we happen to know that you were pregnant at the time. And this is the classic target example that I'm sure your listeners have run into. Uh, If we do that for enough people, here's all the stuff they bought. These people were pregnant. These people weren't. Eventually, the algorithms, you can imagine, essentially learn to draw a line through that data that says the people who did everything above this line are pregnant and the people who did everything below this data aren't uh, or below this line are not pregnant. And that line's actually really complicated because it's in this huge space of many dimensions. And so it's, it's a little trickier mm-hmm. than I explain it. But essentially, that's it. Can we separate, based on behavior, people with this attribute and people without, or people who are going to do this thing and who won't? And it, it really is, at the heart, drawing a line to separate groups of people. And it, it's kind of like that, uh, and I don't remember where I heard the story, but it's something like the government taking advantage of having all this data and to determine if you're going to commit, uh, commit a violent crime or if you're going to be a repeat offender once you get out of jail based upon this series of circumstances that you are, this ser- set of behaviors that you go through. And they, and they have access to, to doing that all uh, online. Is that, is that similar to that? Yeah, and that's, you know, one of the really concerning applications of this data, say using it for uh, sentencing guidelines. Are you likely to reoffend? Like on one hand, that makes sense, right? We want people who are going to do the crime again to maybe stay in jail longer or to get treated differently than people who won't. The problem is that like people who get arrested for crimes, like that's not necessarily a fair system at this point. We know, for example, like if you have a white college kid who gets uh, who a cop spots him smoking marijuana, that he's way less likely to get arrested than a black kid who's not in college. Uh, so same crime, different outcomes. And those show up in the algorithms. They don't know about this issue. So they could essentially say, well, if you're black, you're more likely to reoffend. And that's not something we want them doing. And it's incredibly complicated to teach your algorithms to filter out those kinds of biases that are already kind of complicated to see in the system. So that's just one thing that as the algorithms become more powerful and people want to start using them in new ways, that we really need to think about the fairness of them because we're starting to see unfair applications 
you know, as they're rolled out now. And, and I think what oftentimes will happen is it becomes more of a system divided than a system that comes together. Although this data would be great to bring people together and ha- have a greater understanding of what our inner thoughts are or ha- a greater thought of or a greater um, uh, exp- predictability about what our future behavior is going to be. It's se- I see it as a separation even more so than we already have, a class separation, a race separation, because the algorithms are going to, uh, they may they may end up showing what you just said. Uh, a young black male that smokes marijuana is more likely to commit a crime than a, a, a young white male that's that that gets arrested for marijuana smoking. Yeah, and that's you know so concerning to me, and it's why I spend a lot of time talking about this. Like I build these algorithms, right? So I think they have the potential to do so many good things, but I also see all the ways that they can be used in profoundly unfair ways, and you know they can benefit us in great ways. And if we talk even sort of about the trivial, right? Like you look at Netflix and they engineer shows, right? They create shows based on an analysis of what people like. And that is everything from who's in them to what do the plot lines look like to what does the production look like. And they make stuff that we love, right? And that's a, you know, a kind of trivial example, but a way that you can go like, wow, like this data can lead people to make things that I really like. And you could certainly see it in the healthcare space. Um, Some of these algorithms are so good that they rival the accuracy of like true diagnostic like blood tests for example and they're going to keep getting better so wouldn't it be great if like i can just look at your data instead of having you come in and do this sort of invasive test and get a really good insight about your risk for say developing diabetes or obesity or heart disease and give you some recommendations of ways that you can avoid that like that could be profoundly good but There are all of these tremendously unfair ways that the algorithms are used, especially when they're in the hands of people who don't understand the algorithms, right? So you give a judge one of these. Well, the judge isn't an algorithmic expert. Like, she may not know how these are being used and what data is being fed and what biases are in there, what's filtered for. And that means that she could apply it in a way that she maybe thinks is being fair, but the algorithms aren't. And so we just have to be one tremendously literate in terms of how these are being used, which is a hard thing to do and a hard thing to do fairly. And two, uh, you know, really keep an eye out on what are the biases that can end up in there and how can we control for them. And it's so new that we'd have no idea how to do that at this point. So Jen, ultimately, what is in, in a perfect world, what is the outcome of all of this information? What do you, what do you hope to have done with, with, this, uh, with the algorithms that you're creating or the data that you're extracting from all of this information? So I guess there's two parts of that. One is that a lot of these issues can be mitigated, not all, but a lot, uh, by allowing people to explicitly opt in and consent to the algorithms running on them. Like that can handle a tremendous amount of the fairness. Not all of it, but it'll get us a big step towards that. Um, Once we're there, right, so assuming that everyone has consented, I'm using their data properly, what do I want to do with it? Uh, I would love to be able to have interventions to make people's lives better. And, you know, that could be just sending me ads that I like. Uh, You know, I used to give this example. I, I just turned 40. I've only been married a couple of years, so I spent most of my 30s single, and I spent most of that time getting ads for fertility clinics because, like, the internet <laughs> assumed that, like, single woman in her 30s must really need a baby, and she doesn't have a husband to help her get pregnant. Uh, I did not want a baby, and it drove me crazy to get these ads. Especially and, uh, as a data scientist. <laughs> yeah, like, come on, like, we can do better than this, right? So if I see, you know, I'm going to see ads. Uh, that's how the internet is, you know, works at this point. So if I'm going to see them, like, wouldn't it be great if I can see ads for stuff I want anyway, that aren't annoying, that are really valuable to me, that can bring me to something that I wouldn't have discovered, right? That, I think, is tremendously useful given the environment. Um, So yeah, so that's one side, right? Advertising. On the other side, you know, the general problem is, how do I find information that I need in this huge space of everything online? And some of that's going to be information I don't even know that I need yet. And ideally, these algorithms would bring me to that, right? They're going to find out all this stuff about me and say, look, you may not know that you need this yet, but 
we can tell that this is going to be a problem for you or an opportunity for you. And we're going to drive you to this so you can kind of anticipate that and act. I think that's wonderful. And it has the potential, you know, the healthcare space is a great example, but you could think of it professionally. Hey, if you get this skill, you're going to be much more attractive for future promotions. Or, you know what, like we can tell you're not real happy at your job now. Uh, here's some places where you have exactly the kind of skill set they want that you might be much happier. There's all these ways that our lives can be positively impacted, essentially by driving us to the information we need. And that's why I make these algorithms, because I want to bring that goodness to people. And I always say, can, can you just get out of my world? Not you, not you specifically. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, sometimes we think it's such an invasive part of, uh, of living is, is or the advertising. You know, I don't know what is being uh, funneled to me and what is just being randomly sent to me. If I open up my mailbox because of the neighborhood that I live in, you know, there's a there's a, uh, a thing that says uh, you want your, your gutters cleaned. Well, it's obvious that I have gutters on my house, but that that kind of thing would never come to an apartment where I don't have gutters. It, it, so that's an obvious one. But the things that aren't so obvious are when I turn on my computer, because a lot of this stuff is coming at us digitally. When, I'm, when I turn on my computer, are these ads something that is specifically geared and, and mo- you know, is it directed at me? And and if that's the case, then uh, then I don't, you know, I, I, I'm I'm kind of like torn. Do I want this? Do I not want it? In some cases, I love it. You know, Strick and I, who's my co-host, we had a conversation about this with the Fitbit. I mean, do we want the mind control that a Fitbit provides? Well, you didn't work, you know, walk enough steps today. You know, and, and in some far remote way, that's kind of, in a way, that's managing the data that's going on in your world, right? Yeah, uh, a lot of it is. And some of us want those insights and some of us don't. And I think it's important to think about how we divide the world that way, right? So I had heard, I think, of This American Life podcast where they were talking about something like Huntington's disease or one of these like really, you know, life shortening genetic diseases where you can go get a test and find out if you have it or not. Yeah. And there was this discussion between these sisters, their mother had died of it, and they were talking about whether they should get the test. And I was sort of shocked by this, that there were people who wouldn't want the test, right? But there are definitely people in the world who like, they don't want to find these things out about themselves. They don't want their life impacted this way. Uh, They don't want this sort of personalizing of the way that they might think about their life. And And then there's, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, no, you talk. I'll I'll listen. Go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Just, you know, and then there's people who really do. I think that's, by the way, separate from the privacy issue because I'm very private and wouldn't want that data out there. But thinking about these things that people prefer and what they want insights on and what they don't, I think is important as we have the ability to start offering it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and the entrepreneur in me wants wants to say to you or wants to ask you, why haven't you written a book about this or have you already written? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of data that's out there that supports you writing a book about this. You know all the information, shouldn't you? Or maybe you have already written a book. No, uh, you know, it's interesting. So I am in the process now of talking with a publisher to get a book out there specifically for like the business and entrepreneurial community on these kinds of issues, right? Here's the power of these algorithms. Here's the kind of concerns that you should have about using them and and where you might want to draw the line. Um, It's been interesting. I, I, went through the process of kind of thinking about it a couple years ago, shortly after my TED Talk came out. Uh, and the big data space was just so saturated. And I didn't quite at that point have the, I guess, personal perspective on it to say, like, look, this is really the thing that I want to say. Um, now I feel like I've gone around and I've spent the last two years talking about this to every audience that will listen, which thankfully has been a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, And, you know, it has really crystallized for me this idea of, um, first of all, consent and transparency as a critical part of using these algorithms, uh, but also like just the things we need to understand about people to know whether these algorithms are a good idea to offer them or to use on them or not. Um, And that includes things like how sensitive are you about privacy? I'm tremendously sensitive about that. I'm kind of an extremist about it. Um, but things like what do you want to know and what don't you? What kind of personalization do you want and what don't you? I'm super happy to have ads personalized to my interests if I've consented to the data that they're using for that. Um, I want to know everything that people might guess about my future and and have that told to me. Uh, but there's some people who don't want that. And I think 
figuring out where those lines are and what we want to know about people, uh, that's just as important as everything else. So you're essentially, you know, as a business person, you use these algorithms on the people who are going to appreciate it and you don't waste the time, energy, money, and risk the potential alienation or reputation loss by using them on people who don't want them used. Agreed, agreed. And what's so great, and, and we'll make sure that we put a, um, a link in our show notes uh, how, to be, how people can um, then actually view your, your TED Talk. But what's so great about it is that you're not a scientist scientist, and, and although you have all of this knowledge and this great information, it, you present it in a way that, that it's easily, easy to understand, it, it makes sense, you tell relevant stories, um, you, are typ- you are not your typical scientist, <laughs> I must say that. So, uh, uh, thank you. I don't want to be like that you know, person stuck in the lab who can't talk beyond their formulas. Well, and that's just it. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show, because when I interviewed you as a part of uh, that MACE conference that we met at just a, a month or so ago, what was great about it was that you did have a conversation and it was able to, and I've, and I've interviewed many, many, in, especially in that world, uh, interviewed many people that are extremely technical and um, it does not present well to an audience of, 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 of anything more, of any other than scientists. So for, for me, for me, I our community, I, I know they're smarter than I am, but I'm the present, I'm the messenger of all this information. So if I understand, I'm like, hey, this is pretty good. So uh, <laughs> no, I appreciate. It. We'll we'll put a link again in the show notes about uh, how to get to your how to get to your TED talk. Um, I want to move just for a, to a, for a quick second or two to uh, a part of our show, the rapid fire Q and want to ask you a few questions. If you can put an entrepreneur's hat on, because I know as somebody that's done a TED Talk and someone that presents, you also own a business, and that is the business of your information, and especially if you're going to write a book. So let me ask you a, a few questions as a person rather than as a scientist. Is that cool? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, and there's got to be, as a scientist, some things that you probably aren't good at. So, uh, Jen, what, what is something that you suck at? Calculus. Uh, totally suck at calculus. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. I am really bad at that. I, I, I would have a very tough time even spelling calculus, let alone, <laughs> let alone doing it. Now, how did you pick calculus, Jen? Because, like, I basically have a math degree. I have a minor in math. Uh, a lot of these algorithms actually use a lot of calculus. And so I'm around people who are really good at it, and I do so much math. But I am entirely on like the linear algebra math side, and it's a little embarrassing how bad I am at calculus. Yeah, you know, I was feeling the same thing. I remember when my daughter came home from third grade, I was stuck. I could not even, <laughs> could not even do her, her math. So, yes, I'm a little bit below the calculus level. So thanks, thanks for making it totally uh, understandable for everybody. Else. Is any, how, what percentage of the world knows actually how to do calculus? Any idea? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. No, I don't. But like the percentage of my world that knows calculus is really high. And so I feel like I'm below the mean in terms of my calculus knowledge among my colleagues. Totally relatable. <laughs> thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Jen. Uh, how about uh, let's be confident. What is something that you're really great at? I think I'm good at kind of what we're doing now. Like I feel like I have spent most of my like post teenage life learning how to talk to people and tell stories and make information accessible. And I've worked really hard at it. And I think I'm pretty good at that at this point. All right. And that's a good one, too. And, and I agree. You are very relatable and, and, you, and you can speak at a language level that, uh, that we all understand and not from the science perspective. So thank you for, for doing that. Uh, if you had to pick a song title that, uh, that represented your life, do you, uh, do you have one in mind? Oh, like an actual song? Yeah, do you, do you know? And, and you don't have to. I won't make you sing it or anything. But if you had, <laughs> if you had to pick one that represented your life, you, you, any idea what it would be? Man, uh, <laughs> that's a that's a tough one. Well, I can share. Probably, I, I, oh, go ahead, you go. No, just because I suck at remembering song titles <laughs> mostly. No, that's okay. I was going to say I, I I gave you some hints in the uh, in the initial Q and A, and you you lean towards an Elvis Elvis Costello song called Mystery Dance. And the I listened, Mystery Dance. That's right. We did talk about that. I I did listen to a couple of the lyrics of them, and I was I was I wasn't confused because it it is very interesting. But I, I'm assuming that everything is tied in your world to the word mystery. I would think so. <laughs> yeah, you know, I picked that song. Uh, that's a great song that didn't get listened to enough because I feel like so much of my life, especially like my intellectual life, but but personal too, has just been like, I have no idea what's going on. And that song is about like two people who want to do this dance, but neither of them know how to do it. And they think the other person does. And uh, yeah, I feel like that's a lot of my life. It's just like, I don't know what's going on. And I'm going to kind of fake it 
and then I realize nobody else knows either. And yeah, so totally, I can just make it up. Totally true. No one knows what's going on. We don't. We don't. I, I can predict what's going to happen based upon some algorithms. If you need help, Jen, just let me know and I'll be happy to share with you what's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're probably more likely to be able to do that. Uh, your go- your um, your website is jengolbeck.com. We'll make sure we put a, uh, a link in the show notes so everybody has access to that. Uh, can they get to your TED Talk through your website as well? They can. It's linked up there. Awesome. Awesome. So, Jen, thank you so much for being a part of uh, part of the show today. And thanks for all your information. I'm, I'm so looking forward to getting some feedback from uh, from our listeners about about how the show was, because it really is outside the norm of what we would do, but so fascinating to me. So thanks for being a part of it today. Thank you so much for having me. Nice guy community. Never underestimate the, uh, the power of nice. Again, special thanks to Jen Goldbeck for being a part of our show today. Steve O'Brien, go ahead and take us out of here. For the Nice Guys on Business, I'm Steve O'Brien. Fill up your week with the nice guys. Haven't they run out of people willing to talk to them yet?